And welcome back, folks. Another episode of Master's Class World War I begins. So why does this matter? Well, as European countries formed alliances and increased the sizes of their armed forces, they set the stage for a global war. All they needed was a good reason to mobilize troops. When a Serbian terrorist assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sofia Kocek, World War I soon followed. Chotek, I'm sorry. Uh, the causes of war. So, there was this idea that if people just kind of stuck to their national lines, you have your boundary, this person's country has their boundary, uh, then maybe those states would have a better understanding of where one piece of territory ends and the other begins, and they could instead cooperate and work together and create a peaceful Europe. Well, I think up to this point, uh, the liberals, uh, those who are liberal-minded, had kind of just ignored the reality of what was going on. Yeah, there was cooperation, the concerts of Europe, uh, but that was usually people banding together government forces to, you know, protect the old regime of, you know, absolute right monarchs and divine right monarchs and imperialist ambitions and schemes and uh, the denial of self-determination to minority groups um, when nationalism was springing. So, of course, conflict had always been around, but now it just seems like it has become exacerbated. It has become much larger, aggravated. And so commonly when we talk about World War I, we talk about these four aspects. We talk about nationalism, imperialism, materialism, and alliances. These are like the, the deadly four, uh, the four horsemen, if you will, of the apocalypse that's going to become World War I. So we have these nation states that emerge in Europe in the last half of the 19th century. They have this honor and this pride, this sort of ethnic identity. They feel compelled to compete against other European nation states because they all hold each other uh, in a certain regard, right? Uh, Britain, certainly, the Great Britain, the British, they certainly think they are superior to the other European nation states. Germany, they're going to feel the same. Austria, Hungary is going to feel the same. France, they all hold themselves as there are none that are higher in authority than their own self-interests. And they're each guided by their own self-interest. This is why we see, you know, um, in the Belgian Congo, these horrible atrocities committed in, in the Congo and Africa, in the Free State uh, of Congo and Africa and by the Belgians. And uh, they are willing to exploit the interests of other people, violently so, cruelly, uh, for their own self-interest. Uh, all for rubber, all for raw materials and goods, all for profit. Uh, and, and there's not too many of these nation states that are above this, if we're going to be quite honest. So this is an attitude that's going to carry over into the 20th century, to the early 1900s, as everybody's looking for their own best interests, and they are more than willing to use violence and exploitation of other people's to continue to maintain the status quo of their power, right? To either maintain it or to grow their influence and power. And this is where that imperialism piece comes in, uh, into the 19th century, into the 20th century. Um, they're competing as a result of this. They're all competing against each other, as I mentioned uh, earlier especially in Africa, you know, everybody's in the scramble for Africa looking for the extraction of raw materials and resources and to exploit, you know, the indigenous people for labor. And because of this, there's conflict, right? Uh, there's heightened rivalries. We certainly saw that with the English and the Dutch uh, in South Africa and the Boer Wars, um, you know, where those Dutch Afrikaner farmers were being, you know, driven off of what they considered to be their land, their territory that they had colonized, as the English pushed them uh, sort of out. Uh, they sort of claimed South South Africa. So there are violent conflicts, right? There are militaristic conflicts that are going to occur between these European nation states 
for a greater slice of the pie, if you will. So nationalism is like the brother of imperialism. Um, you know, you have all these ethnic groups in Europe, and not every country, not every nation state is 100% homogenous, uh, which is to say, you know, when you go to Austria-Hungary, as an example, you know, they are right by the Balkans. They're their empire brushes right up against the Balkans. And as a result, you have Bulgaria, you have Serbia, you have Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, you have all these places. And uh, you, therefore, you have a Slavic minority, right? The Slavic peoples. Um, and of course, you know, right up top. And we'll, we'll go to a map to view this as well. In fact, do that right now. So we can see what I'm talking about. You have your Romania right there. So from Russia, you have all these Slavic peoples. The massive majority of Russia is Slavic. And then going to Romania, Slavic, Serbia, Slavic, Bulgaria. So you have these interesting uh, elements that are playing out, you know, with with uh, ethnic groups and, and as it relates to nationalism especially. So uh, they have a large German populace, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which leads to the dual alliance between them and Germany. Um, but they don't want to be under the thumb of this, you know, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, the Serbs, they want their autonomy. They don't just want to be a part of the empire, they want their autonomy. Um, and, and Russia certainly dreams of being the mother nation, if you will, to a Slavic empire. So you do have these nationalist elements that are going to rise up. And, and of course, the Irish and the British Empire. They, well, you're going to have those in Ireland who are definitely for British rule. Uh, and you're also going to have those in Ireland who are very much against British rule. Uh, and they are going to want to break away. And even in Russia, you have the Ukrainians and the Poles, both Slavic, right? But they have their own ideas for self-autonomous, you know, governments, uh, self-representative governments to break away from Russia. So you have these elements of nationalism and imperialism, right? We're expanding territories. You have certain nations that are... Uh, conquering other nations and, of course, incorporating certain peoples who might be minority groups into their empires. Um, and they feel a resentment as a result of this. And, of course, with imperialization comes undoubtedly industrialization, right? Uh, we're getting raw materials and resources and we are using those to create fine, manufactured, mechanical materials, tools, shipbuilding is huge. This is going to go hand in hand with the other of the big four, which is of course militarization, right? Militarism. Because you're not just building ships for trade. Uh, we're going to see the rise of new warships. Uh, the Dreadnought is going to be a, a massive innovation leading into World War I, heavily used by the English and then emulated by the Germans uh, on the outset of World War One, as Germany is also going to scramble to compete with uh, England's, you know, massive military by trying to build up their navy. And of course, you know, you need iron. And then, of course, from iron, you need things like the Bessemer process. You need to to process it into steel. And then, you know, you have these different chemicals that you can maybe use for weapons. Um, so we're going to see with mass society, mass production, uh, with industrialization, industrialization comes uh, the growth of new massive armies and navies. Uh, and this is really going to intensify the relationships of these European powers uh, as their militaries become much, much larger. I mean, Russia at this point, I mean, we, we know it as the Russian steamroller in world history. 
I mean, if you just look at the size comparison, geographically speaking, you know, I mean, Russia is gigantic. And as a result, their military, as you can see from the stat right here, I mean, Russia alone is going to have about 1.3 million men uh, in their army, which is, you know, the largest in the world at this point. And most countries, to add to the tensions, they feed propaganda, right? Anti, you know, nationalist, uh, you know, sentiments regarding other nations that they don't control or people that they don't fully control. And conscription, which is to say a military draft, right? Where we, we have something of a lottery, uh, where, where men are supposed to uh, sign up for the military they're automatically registered. Uh, they have a term of service they have to render as part of their citizenship. They're drafted. Uh, there's a lotto. It happens. And this is the norm in this era. Very regular practice. So we see this the army is becoming much larger. Uh, France and Germany, they're not too far behind themselves. They have quite the impressive militaries. Um, Russia is seen as something as a joke, militarily speaking. I shouldn't say that. Mm, like, yeah, there's something of a joke because they lose horrendously to the Japanese in 1905 in the, uh, uh, the Russian-Sino War. Um, and it's, it's a pretty big mollywhopping the Russians take, and people just wonder how on earth could the tiny island of Japan you know, beat Russia, uh, unless Russia's military system was just, you know, completely backwards. And guess what? They're going to prove how backwards their military really is uh, in World War I. We're going to get into that in another lesson, though. Uh, but the French, the Germans, the British, they all have crack militaries. Uh, the Austro-Hungarians and the Italians, although they kind of have, you know, new numbers, uh, they're really not the best. They have they have their own victories here and there, but they, the, especially Austria-Hungary, you know, when we see World War One break out, they're going to suffer humiliating losses. Uh, so as a result of this, right, militarism, this is another big aspect, right? Uh, because you have these large militaries, you have these complex ideas and plans for how to quickly mobilize all these soldiers. And of course, you have to feed them, you have to equip them, you got to supply them. So keeping up a large military is very expensive. Russia knows this, um, but Russia seems to be doing better at this time than most. Uh, they have an enormous burden, economically speaking, to support their massive military. Uh, but before World War I hits, they're actually kind of turning something of a, of a profit. They're, 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 they're able to afford it. They're doing well. Now, the thing is, when you make a plan to go to war, uh, either offensively or defensively, and you have these plans on how to quickly mobilize these soldiers and to equip them, you can't just make any change because it creates a domino effect on your plans, right? And this can cause chaos. This can cause a uh, lack of communication on the field. Um, and so military leaders often insist in this era that they really can't alter their plans. Like, this is the plan. We have to stick to it. And as a result of this, uh, the politicians who may not have any military experience don't have any real leverage or leeway or ability to argue against this. So these ideas of geopolitics, they're not really just political. They're militaristic in their rationale, the decisions that are going to be made. And lastly, of the big four, we have the alliance system. So as, you're, as these militaries are getting massive, uh, and as we can look at geopolitics, just, you know, the geography of things, of nations competing against one another for other territory, uh, they're suppressing the nationalist movements, 
for self-determination and independence of you know ethnic minority groups within their boundaries. Um, they are competing against one another for raw materials and resources in other territories such as in Africa. Uh, you're going to get alliances because there's fear, and there should be fear. Look at look at Germany, right, and its boundaries and their relationship and what becomes known as the Triple Alliance. Austria-Hungary is the, is the dual alliance between the two of them, and then Italy joins into the mix for the Triple Alliance. And they are sandwiched, right? France, a great military power at this time, Great Britain, and then Russia on the other side, terrifying that Russian steamroller can come in and press them and allow the British Navy and the French Army to basically control, well, the British Navy clearly controls uh, the seas up north, France down south, Russia smashes against them, they have Slavic allies below, uh, and this is a terrifying place to be, you know, you're, you're sandwiched between your enemies, if you will. And this is where alliances come into play. Because you don't make alliances with groups that you believe you can defeat. You make alliances with nations that you fear, that you're not 100% certain that you could defeat, militarily speaking. Uh, and, and, and of course, there's other factors. You, you make an alliance with those that you know, you're afraid of, to keep them at peace so you can build up militarily, so you can compete with them in the future if the need arises. And of course, because maybe there's also a shared culture or heritage. Uh, that's certainly the case between Germany and Austria-Hungary. There are a lot of Germans in Austria-Hungary, Germanic peoples. Um, so we have these alliances. We have the Triple Alliance, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. And then we have, you know, formed in 1882. And then we have France, Great Britain, and Russia creating the Triple Entente, or the Entente Cordiale, as the French would put it, uh, in 1907. And in the early years of the 20th century, we're going to see kind of test runs of battles and how these alliances might play out. Uh, we're going to have two Balkan wars in this region, if you will, uh, against the Ottoman Empire, the Turks. Um, a group known as the Young Turks kind of takes power, and they kind of spawn, kind of unwittingly, these sort of nationalist movements uh, from young Serbian and Slavic students throughout Romania, Bulgaria, even in Greece, uh, Albania, you know, I mentioned Serbia. Um, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, right over here, which is, becomes annexed by Austria. Um, and they're going to want to break away from the Ottoman Empire to be separate, uh, to gain their own sense of semblance of independence. Um, and they gain territory. They're ultimately successful in the First Balkan War, but <clears throat> Bulgaria is not happy with how the land is split up between them and Greece and Serbia and Romania, though there's a second Balkan War. And in both Balkan Wars, Serbia does incredibly well for themselves. They, they cut off a swath of land, they get independence, um, they gain territory, um, they are militaristically speaking tried and true. Um, so you see these conflicts, and while those conflicts are breaking out, that leaves the other European states kind of angry. They're eager for revenge. They're, um, they're, they're afraid of the growing influence in this region by you know, Slavic powers. Uh, Russia certainly is salivating for the opportunity to unite these nations. Maybe not so much Greece, but Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, you know, Albania. Uh, they're looking to spread uh, particularly in Romania, Bulgaria, and Serbia, uh, to create a Slavic, you know, union, uh, where, where Russia is, like I said, the satellite state, the mother to them all. Uh, and that is going to have Austria-Hungary very worried, as is Germany, and they're going to sort of threaten Russia by putting troops all along the border. 
uh, of Russia and Romania to, uh, you know, dissuade them from participating and aiding. And that will ultimately be successful, but it shows that those tensions are already there. And those wars are costly. Uh, there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives lost in the First and Second Balkan Wars. And it seems like this is going to serve as something of a template for a greater conflict should these alliance systems break down and they're not able to sort of dissuade or discourage other nations from participating in what are, you know, regional or, you know, local conflicts. So all of these factors, right, all those factors play a role in starting World War I. So it's going to be after the crisis in the Balkans, so after 1913, on how the politics, geopolitics, and nationalism, imperialism, militarism all play out in that Second Balkan War especially. Because here we have uh, Austria-Hungary, who has successfully annexed uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and Serbia desperately wants to sort of uh, help out their Slavic brothers, right, the Bosnians, uh, to achieve self-determination and independence. And Serbia is going to be supported by Russia. Uh, how do they, you know, support them? Well, they support them with finances. They support them with, you know, training and and and, and firearms. Um, they say they'll back their play should a military conflict break out in the future. Uh, and of course, you know, Russia. Like I said, they're they're driven because they want to. Serbia wants an independent Slavic state in the Balkans, and Russia wants to, you know, basically control it. Uh, they want to unite. And Austria-Hungary is not going to give the Slavic minority, uh, the Bosnians, uh, you know, the kind of rights that they gave to the Hungarians. They want to prevent that from happening. So it really all comes to a head on June 28, 1914, when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, or Francis Ferdinand, pictured here, He's a nephew of Franz Joseph. He is the heir of, to the Habsburg throne of Austria-Hungary. Franz Joseph is uh, well into his elderly age. He's like in his 80s or 90s uh, by the time, you know, and Franz Ferdinand here is about in, in his 50s. So he's a young lad compared to Franz Joseph. Uh, and he's expected to take the throne. Um, he is going to marry an aristocrat, Sophia Chotek. Uh, she's not of royal blood, though, and so as a result, he has to promise uh, that none of his children will ever take the throne. Uh, so they are going to visit the city of Sarajevo in Bosnia, the capital of Bosnia, part of their empire. Um, and they're, they're, during their visit, uh, Franz Ferdinand is not like his uncle, who, when he visited, was very much aware of, you know, Serbian nationalists and, you know, anti-Hungarian, anti-Austro-Hungarian sentiment. Uh, you know, he took armed guards with him. Uh, Francis Ferdinand doesn't really do that. Uh, he has a small retinue of police officers, both plain clothes, who kind of mix into the crowd, as well as like some bodyguards. But like it is, it is very small. They're ver and they're driving in around in a limousine chauffeur, uh, a convertible uh, that is just begging, begging for assassination. Uh, and so you have it that prior to this, Francis Ferdinand was sort of cracking down on universities and schools in Bosnia uh, where, you know, Slavic students were, uh, you know, giving, you know, uh, nationalist speech rallies calling for, you know, unification with Serbia, 
Um, they're calling for their break away from Austria-Hungary to uh, create an independent nation state um, for Bosnia. Uh, and so he really cracks down on the students in these clubs uh, at these universities. And one such student is going to lead a group of conspirators in the streets. The student actually tries to join the military, but is seen unfit for service, too weak. Um, and this student reads a lot. He reads a lot. Uh, he's a very well-read individual, and he is perhaps one of the most influential teenagers in all of world history, uh, Gavrilo Princip. And Greg Gavrilo Princip is a Bosnian Serb. Uh, after he fails to enlist in the military uh, back in 1913 for that Second Balkan War to play his part, he becomes obsessed with nationalism, uh, with Slavic identity, with the Serbs, uh, with movements that, you know, strike a blow against the oppressive geopolitics of the Austro-Hungarians. Uh, what's funny is that although Francis Ferdinand uh, was not for nationalism, he was not for the sort of break away from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, he was more of a moderate. He wasn't a divine right monarch, that's for certain. Uh, he was an absolutist, uh, and he probably would have been a moderate voice that would have pushed for giving the rights, the kind of rights, uh, to Serbia and Bosnia even, uh, as they did with Austria-Hungary to grow the empire. Uh, but the thing is, the Serbs didn't want that, and neither did Princip. Uh, and as such, Princip becomes a member of this organization known as the Black Hand. Uh, they are a Serbian terrorist organization that wanted to free Bosnia. They want to be free from Austria-Hungary um, and become part of the large Serbian kingdom. Um, and it's believed, some say, and this is a historical debate, some argue that no, the Serbian government did not supply weapons and money uh, to the Black Hand. Um, there are other historians that argue that they very much did. Either way, we're going to see how this is going to play out in this assassination attempt. You see, earlier that morning, on June 28th, one of the conspirators had failed. Uh, they had thrown a bomb at the vehicle, which we can see pictured here. That, and you can see, like, you know, open top convertible uh, limousine chauffeur. Uh, this is an assassin's dream right here. Well, one of the assassin's pistols failed to fire, another threw a bomb, it bounced off the car and into the crowd, injuring two of the uh, guards that were following, uh, and several civilians as well. But neither Sophia or Francis Ferdinand pictured here in the back. Um, and they managed to escape. They managed to escape. And what they're going to do is they're going to pay a visit that same day to the hospital. Uh, where those individuals who were injured by the bomb were. And Francis Ferdinand is really upset, uh, even though he went in with this idea that it's all in God's hands. He kind of changes his mind now. Uh, he says, maybe I should have brought more guards. And also, I'm furious with this city. I want to leave, and we are going to punish. We're going to punish the Bosnians. Uh, we're going to uh, enact, you know, some punitive taxes. Uh, we're going to go after uh, the Black Hand. We're going to oust them. There's certainly not going to be, I think, at this point, um, any inclusion of, you know, you know. Serbs into an Austro-Hungarian Serbian Empire. Uh, there's not going to be a triple monarchy, as it were. But on their way from the hospital, uh, you see, it's not just the one vehicle, it's a line of vehicles that's kind of leading them in a procession. And what winds up happening is that uh, they get lost. And they happen to turn a corner where Princip is kind of moping. 
They had failed in the assassination. He got himself a sandwich. He's eating at this cafe. And as he's exiting, who should be passing literally right by him on that street corner? And so this seems like the gods had fated Francis Ferdinand to die. And so he takes his pistol out. Um, they had a guard who was kind of standing on this sort of rail on the car, uh, but he was on the opposite side. He had a saber, a sword in his hand, uh, but because he's on the opposite side of the vehicle, he cannot react or get over to save Francis Ferdinand and his wife. Two shots is all it takes to kill the both of them. Immediately, Princip is beaten to within an inch of his life and arrested to be harshly interrogated. And it's here that the you know Austro-Hungarian government doesn't really know what to do. They don't know if the Serbian government was directly involved or not, but it doesn't really matter at this point because we have these sort of ethnic and nationalist ideas that have played out. And now this is really a great excuse. This is an opportunity to use their military. Uh, war can solve problems. And the problem they have is, well, with the Serbian nationalist movements and these terrorist organizations. And so we can see from this quote, quote, to render Serbia innocuous once and for all by a display of force, end quote, as the Austrian foreign minister put it. Uh, they want to, you know, attack Serbia. Uh, they want to claim territory. They want to have Serbia answer for the death of their archduke. But Russia is still there. Russia is still a problem. This alliance they have, they know they have Serbia's back. So they're going to seek out their German allies and Emperor William II or Kaiser Wilhelm II. He is going to give Austria-Hungary what's known as the blank check. Or rather, I should say, uh, Bethmann Holvig, um, his, uh, his, his chief advisor, if you will, his foreign minister, I should say. Because uh, right now, Kaiser Wilhelm is on like a 10-day cruise on a yacht. Uh, when all this goes down, he's away from it all. So Bethmann Holvig, um, along with uh, Moltke the Younger, uh, sort of conspire with the foreign minister of Austria-Hungary uh, and Franz Joseph of Austria-Hungary, uh, the uncle of Francis Ferdinand. And they're going to, you know, go to war. So they basically say, Whatever you need, the blank check, whatever you need, whatever support. And war is going to break out between Russia and Austria-Hungary. Because as Austria-Hungary gives the Serbs an ultimatum, um, which the Serbians believe that you know the ultimatum that they're given uh, is unreasonable, they want to basically allow the, you know, Austria-Hungary basically wants Serbia to basically give up its right to self-determination. Uh, it's seen as unacceptable, and this is where the domino effect comes into play here. Uh, so to put it in short, Serbia doesn't fulfill the ultimatum. Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia, and they're going to launch a massive attack on Serbia's capital in Belgrade and in Belgrade, um, and then from there, Russia has been pre-mobilizing, and now they mobilize against both Austria-Hungary and Germany. Germany, in turn, has that blank check. They, they back, you know, Austria-Hungary. They go to war. Uh, France is an ally of Russia, so then they go to war with Germany, and then Germany uses this method and we're going to skip ahead right here. What is the Schlieffen Plan? Uh, it came up by their general, Alfred von Schlieffen. Um, and this is basically, we're going to have a small holding pattern 
a holding maneuver to keep kind of Russia in place while the majority of the German military marches through Belgium to avoid any of the defensive borders, uh, such as the Maginot Line, the French had set up with machine guns. So they're going to go through Belgium, invade Belgium, and then through Belgium, go right to the capital, Paris, and try to knock the French out of the war super quick. Well, England supports the independence of Belgium, so when they are not granted permission to march through Belgium and they invade Belgium and they attack civilians, uh, England gets in on the mix. They declare war against Germany. And now we basically have a world war here as the domino effect of alliances sprawls out of control. Uh, and this is going to lead to a conflict of which the world had never yet seen.